Among Lincoln's unconstitutional acts were launching an invasion without the consent of Congress, blockading southern ports before formally declaring war, unilaterally suspending the writ of habeas corpus, arresting and imprisoning thousands of northern citizens without a warrant, censoring telegraph communications, forcing citizens to accept as legal money pieces of printed paper unbacked by silver or gold, confiscating private property including firearms, effectively gutting the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, robbing, raping, and burning the homes of undefended southern civilians, not just men and women, but as Sherman would freely admit in his memoirs, children as well. Even worshipful Lincoln biographers and historians called him a dictator. In his book, Constitutional Dictatorship, Clinton Rossiter devoted an entire chapter to Lincoln and calls him a great dictator. Quote, Lincoln's amazing disregard for the Constitution was considered by nobody as legal. Abraham Lincoln, named the great emancipator and champion of the Constitution by government school textbooks, was more concerned with exercising federal control over sovereign states than he was in freeing the Negro from the shackles of slavery. He himself made this clear in no uncertain terms. On March 4, 1861, Lincoln clarified his position on slavery in his first inaugural address on the east portico of the Capitol building. Quote, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. While America's children continue to be brainwashed into believing that Lincoln was the savior of the black man, the congressman from Illinois tells a different tale in his fourth debate with Stephen Douglas at Charleston, Illinois on September 18, 1858. Quote, I will say then that I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. I am not now nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say in addition to this that there is a physical difference between the white and black races which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. And inasmuch as they cannot so live, while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. The long list of Lincoln's recorded remarks, which would readily and fervently be condemned as racist hate speech today, includes his views on the expansion of slavery. Lincoln wrote, quote, There is a natural disgust in the minds of nearly all white people to the idea of indiscriminate amalgamation, that is, mixture, of the white and black races. A separation of the races is the only perfect preventative of amalgamation. But as an immediate separation is impossible, the next best thing is to keep them apart where they're not already together. If white and black people never get together in Kansas, they will never mix blood in Kansas. On equality, Lincoln said, quote, I have no purpose to introduce political and social equality between the white and black races. There's physical difference between the two which, in my opinion, will probably forever forbid their living together upon the footing of perfect equality, and inasmuch as it becomes a necessity that there must be a difference, I, as well as Judge Douglas, am in favor of the race to which I belong, having the superior position." End quote. On interracial marriage, Lincoln said, Our Republican system was meant for a homogenous people. As long as blacks continue to live with the whites, they constitute a threat to the national life. Family life may also collapse, and the increase of mixed breed bastards may someday challenge the supremacy of the white man." End quote. Ironically, rather than freeing slaves, Lincoln, through the Enrollment Act, which conscripted men between the ages of 20 and 45 to be, quote, liable to perform military duty in the service of the United States, created a slave class to be used as enforcers of the federal will. Though many erroneously believe that the Civil War was fought primarily over the issue of slavery, that notion is undermined by the well-publicized letter written to the New York Tribune's editor Horace Greeley on August 22, 1862, during the heart of the actual battle. 
In it, Lincoln himself reveals his real reason for initiating the conflict when he wrote, quote, if I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union." End quote. His focus was and had always been on saving or strengthening the Union and therefore the power of the federal government, not on extending a hand to lift the black man from the plight of his slavery. In the volume of his writings beginning in his first inaugural address, quote, saving the Union is synonymous with his desire to strengthen the grip of the federal government on any and all citizens, any and all territories, any and all states. State secession, as addressed in his speeches, was not only undesirable, it was unacceptable. And if it came to one state's desire to separate from his union, he would, as seen by his instigation of the War of Northern Aggression, set out to teach them a lesson with the strong arm of federal power. No state, he said, upon its own mere motion can lawfully get out of the union. Resolves and ordinances to that effect are legally void." End quote. And as if prophesying the events he would provoke just one month later by fortifying Fort Sumter, which was situated on the sovereign soil of Confederate-controlled South Carolina, Lincoln declared that, quote, acts of violence within any state or states against the authority of the United States are insurrectionary or revolutionary, end quote. He also conveniently mentioned 40 days before the battle at Fort Sumter, quote, there needs to be no bloodshed or violence, and there shall be none, unless it be forced upon the national authority. In April 1861, after repeated calls by the South Carolina government to evacuate Union troops from the newly seceded region went unheeded, Lincoln took opportunity to knowingly incite the South Carolinian troops to use force upon the national authority by sending supply ships to fortify Union-controlled Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. After Confederate troops fired on Fort Sumter, Lincoln, 18 days later, admitted in a letter to Captain G.B. Fox that he expected the retaliation, which he then used as the pretext to garner Northern support and launch a full-scale war against his own countrymen. In a May 1st, 1861 letter to Fox, Lincoln wrote, quote, you and I both anticipated that the cause of the country would be advanced by making the attempt to provision Fort Sumter, even if it should fail. And it is no small consolation now to feel that our anticipation is justified by the result. That result is what we now know as the Civil War. No one was killed or wounded in the 36-hour battle at Fort Sumter, and the War of Northern Aggression had begun. The Lincoln myth today serves the purpose of the regime, both Democrat and Republican. It serves the purpose of the regime in which power is completely centralized, in which decentralization of power is viewed as suspect. People who promote a centralized authority claim that those who object to it must want to bring slavery back if they favor states having sovereign power. It is Lincoln who inaugurates this version of the United States a version that is completely at odds with liberty. Those who want to exercise unchecked power over the American public continue to foster these myths. Years before the war, Lincoln sternly threatened, quote, the Union in any event will not be dissolved. We don't want to dissolve it. And if you attempt it, we won't let you. With the purse and sword, the army and navy and treasury in our hands and at our command, you could not do it." End quote. For Lincoln, contrary to popular history, government was a federal proposition that would be imposed with tyrannical fervor upon those who did not want it. And apparently, it mattered not how many souls had to die to accomplish his objective. If you enjoyed this video and you think others could benefit by viewing it, click that like button and share it on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you want to see more videos like this, as well as a mix of other content, give that subscribe button a click. For more information and additional content, let's connect on Facebook at facebook.com slash highimpactflicks and reach out to me on Twitter at highimpactflicks. Until next time, remember, it's easier to deceive the masses than to convince them that they've been deceived.